and welcome to Netball Nation. Uh, you can see I'm a special guest. I've made it. I've been <laughs> subbed in. It's amazing. It's, I think it's the final show of series two and I finally got my spot. I've been sitting we've bench gone, warming. We've gone to rolling subs on, on this oh, as well. I wish rolling subs I'd have been in, in weeks ago. <laughs> um, but you'll be pleased to know we do have our regular starting seven, Sarah and Maggie. Hello. Welcome. Hi. Uh, come on, talk to me. What have you been doing? Oh, cripes. Well, this week I was shamed into uh, doing some baking. So I've been helping out at a netball camp and the Twitter just got a little bit crazy prior to uh, doing my bit there. Oh, you see, this, well, is, this is what happens when you tell people about baking. Correct, Talking Sarah. You were saying, oh, she talks about it, but nobody's ever seen yeah, it. Nobody's ever tasted it. So I just rustled a little bit of something up and took it to the girls and it was very much needed. So that was it. My shaming came off well. Yeah. I'm I'm more interested that you got to do a netball camp. We're back. We are back officially. I mean, are we allowed to throw to each other yet? Is that a thing or? Well, I mean, we even had um, club trials over the last two weekends. And so the first weekend, it was literally just a coach and five players doing the old drills and skills and just, you know, measuring them on that. And then last weekend that's just gone, ooh, you can have 30 people on a court together. So we actually, <laughs> actually had um, some match play with um, i was gonna say how's the four foot it was business going it was, do you know what sarah it, it was weird so we had you know proper umpires that came along spoke to the girls explained what the rules were going to be and it's just so strange you know to see people stood on a uh, you know a line waiting for a center pass but they're almost you know in <laughs> dotted across the line <laughs> yeah there's just my kind of game and... <laughs> that, was, that was how i defended to be honest <laughs> off marking <laughs> just so strange and i'll just cover this space <laughs> yeah, it's true it's true and like when there's a, a contact in the circle telling the goalkeeper you've got to stand four feet away but get out the circle feet at the post she literally has to stand stand offside so but you know what putting all that aside and all the you know, the bits that we have to put into play to make sure that everybody's safe. It was just fabulous to actually see a ball being passed from one person to another. It was just awesome. It's the, it's the little things. <laughs> oh, God, yes. <yeah. laughs> <Really pleased. laughs> yeah. so, like, what Like the Friends episode where they play catch for hours. <laughs> yeah, no. Trapper. Um, so go on, Sars. What can, what can you add to that? I'm guessing your week hasn't been filled with baking and camp coaching. <laughs> I don't know what you mean, Tamsin. Um... <laughs> No, it hasn't. Um, although we are back at Loughborough, we, um, I've done now two sessions and in an indoor sports hall with players Ooh. and a ball. <gasps> with, with, with contracted players? Is this, this a thing? Are we going to get some scoops? Oh, um, I don't know. Some, like, a few of them seem to have lost their pens to be able to sign these contracts. Uh, so, yeah, I think a couple of them might be contracted by now. Otherwise, we'll have to ch kick them out the session soon. Okay, well, we will get on to that. Um, but first, uh, let's not forget about our amazing competition this August, powered by Netball UK and supported by ASICS. Uh, we are giving you the chance to win a pair of ASICS brand new netball trainers for you and a pair for your friend. Uh, so this week, uh, we're telling you about the first upgrade in the ASICS GS Junior shoe. Um, it's the first upgrade they've had in a few years. So the ASICS Professional 2 GS Junior Netball Shoe is the best junior shoe around. It has excellent cushioning and support for growing feet. Uh, the rear foot gel ensure the necessary cushioning while the foot strikes and ensuring the foot remains stable. Uh, the Trustic System technology supports stable movements by reinforcing the middle part of the sole and preventing the shoe from twisting. With this netball shoe being a takedown of the ASICS flagship netball shoe, the professional FF2, it ensures young netballers feel like one of their idols. Ah. And these sound like they'd be excellent for my daughter, Jamie. So Netball UK, uh, she is age seven and she's a size three. She's got big feet, which is good for netball. Jamie and needs to get, get on this and get entering. That's what she needs to do. Well, and she loves pink. So, I mean, this is... This oh, tick, 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 tick. She's got her iPad. When she gets it back from this show, she can have it and get on there. Um, so if you want to win win some as well go to the my netball nation website click on the banner and the home page and you'll be back to the court ready with netball uk and asics are you impressed ladies i read off a script are you impressed Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> natural, <laughs> natural. 
<laughs> there we go. We got we got through it. But it's a great competition, so please do check it out. And uh, Netball UK, I wasn't joking. Net- Jamie definitely needs some trainers. <laughs> uh, anyway, so on this show this week, uh, the Netball Super League transfer window is open. And I'm hoping it's, it's a bit shorter and condensed than last season. But we will get on to that. The moves, the, the stayers, who do we want to see in the Super League? Um, of course, we'll be talking about that and answering more of your questions. Um, and we'll be looking back at the ANZ Grand Final. It wasn't probably the classic we all wanted, but uh, Paul's very dominant. Uh, and of course, we will review Super Netball um, as well so far. I know Sarah's very happy because Fever <laughs> have had a little win. So that, that keeps like her green. happy at home. <laughs> Well, I'm very excited about this next guest. Talk Radio Drive Time host and showbiz journalist, Dan Wotton. You have joined us. I'm so excited because this feels so weird. I listen every week and so it's like I've come inside my favourite podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, you are a big fan of the show and I also know you are a netball groupie. You are one of our netball geeks. We often have little Twitter Twitter debates going on, so that's great. Um, so where do you listen to the podcast, first of all? What, what do you do? Is it your runner? Is it, what is it, your chill well, actually, out? Last time I messaged Sarah, you're going to hate this, I was walking around Mykonos Town listening <laughs> to the podcast. It was like the best possible place to do so. <laughs> but no, I'm a huge podcast listener anyway. And I think, especially when it comes to netball, it's so exciting because obviously we have such a lack um, of coverage in the mainstream media. And so these podcasts are popping up. And I think it's so important. Obviously, you'd hope one day it will be a big TV show. But for the moment, uh, I think the podcast and YouTube is just such a brilliant way. I, I remember Dan J. Clark telling me that um, when they went to the, the BAFTAs after winning the gold at, at Commonwealth Games, like no one knew who they were at the BAFTAs, obviously, but like these big TV and film stars. And Dan went up to them and was like talking to them about the game. And Jade was just like, this guy came up and he knew everything. Like he knew... <laughs> He yeah, so, uh, knew details. He knew players. He, she was like, it was the best thing ever. Well, I was so yeah, I was so excited. But because I, I was on the red carpet for ITV, you know, interviewing all, all the stars, and actually Jade hunted me down. And <laughs> oh, that's all, how it went. All the ladies, but I was literally so excited, and I didn't care about any other. Yeah, like, no, 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 yeah like Brad Pitt strolling past because you're talking to a yeah. bunch of netballers. <laughs> that was just after the Commonwealth Games gold as well. So yeah. it was like a really, really exciting moment. And that night was another brilliant moment for netball, I think. It was indeed. And I think you picked up on the 2018 Commonwealth gold. We'll forget about the World Cup last year. We'll get well, on to that won't. in a minute. I, I don't know, you <laughs> won't. But, but will you t- tell us about the 2018 Commonwealth Games? Um, you've lived in England. You were born in New Zealand, but yeah. you've lived in England for a long time. So we'll get on to the Silver Ferns in a second. But how, um, how did you find that England beating the Aussies? I mean, because we always have this little thing that if we, you know, anybody beats Australia, you're like, yes. So is, is that the same for a Kiwi? Were you, were you happy oh, to see yeah. the England girls win? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, yes, we have to talk about the Silver Ferns in a moment. But if uh, the Silver Ferns aren't playing, I'm now an out and out Roses supporter. <laughs> <laughs> clearly I can never support the Aussie Diamonds so that moment was just amazing because obviously New Zealand wasn't in the final and actually it had been such a disastrous Commonwealth Games for New Zealand anyway which we won't talk about and so I was just rooting for England all the way and obviously for me what was so exciting is you saw it trending on Twitter you saw all of these big names finally realizing what an incredible game netball was you know it was such a moment for the sport and clearly it created Probably, I don't know if you guys agree, but the first real English netball superstars as mm-hmm. well in um, Helen Housby and Joe Harton. And I think we need that. You know, we need these players that are controversial and everyone's talking about and glamorous and obviously also incredibly, incredibly talented. So I think it was such an exciting moment. Definitely. Now you're involved in, in mainstream media and also an Apple fan, which is very handy. Um, we talk a lot about profile and how we expand not only netball, but women's sport as well. What else do you think can be done? Because, you know, we are pushing the sport in various ways, various platforms like this. But from, from your point of view, where do you see the next step for netball in particular, but also women's sport? Well, so much more has to be done. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I still struggle with it in this country. I mean, 
people don't understand what it's like as a netball fan in New Zealand, literally, if there's a big Silver Ferns game on, if there's something like the retirement of Laura Langman, you know, it is the lead story on the TV sports national news. It is the lead story on the back page. I mean, sorry, you know that having uh, spent a season in Wellington. I mean, it's definitely up there as a genuine talked about mainstream sport. And also the idea that not every game in the Super League is televised still is really shocking to me because obviously again in New Zealand and Australia every game is televised there are big TV deals so I mean we are so far far behind there's so much work to be done I loved in the podcast the other day when you were uh, suggesting uh, sponsors Max that should be getting involved and they should uh, but I think the key is going to be Sky Sports just just backing netball and I think they need to uh, because they are going to be under a lot of pressure to back more female sports but Mm. it is frustrating it's difficult and it's like there is you know there's a long way to go. So talk to me about your experience in Wellington then so Dan you know Dan sort of touched on that what was it different were you walking down the street with your hat pulled down and your sunglasses on or? (laughs) I do that here Tamsin all the time. Um, That round Loughborough around the university? (laughs) Around around the mad streets of Loughborough. Um, No it it was different and and I think you know point one is that the Kiwis are so friendly that it's never it's never a sort of mobbing in any kind it's like oh my god great game last night or like hard look like you guys were so close it, it was so nice but it was different because you'd walk into a coffee shop and the the person serving you would be like oh no this is on the house you know great game last night and you're like it, it's it's a, a bit of a switch in your mentality to understand that people watch it all the time like here you just kind of assume that no one really knows like what's going on whereas there everyone knows and then you'll sit down with your free coffee that you've got and then you'll go on the back page and someone's a hero and someone's getting slated in the paper from the game last night and it's just all a bit like this is this is how it's meant to be you know like it, it's not um it's not a football kind of level of I think stupidity it's just a real appreciation for the sport and I was so thankful um for everyone in 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 Wellington because you felt the support when you're in that team that you know the crowds it was always it, it sold out in the arenas the crowds were so nice. You, you took the time to speak to them afterwards. And it's such a, a good feel. And we've kind of seen that a little bit here. But I think, like Dan said, there's so much more to go and there's so much more to add to that. Like if everyone saw every game of the Super League on TV, that's when you start to build those personalities of, of you know, we've got the Joe and Serena and Helen. But actually, you know, you've got lots of people within our league who are big personalities that people just don't know. So picking up on those big personalities, Dan, I'm going to put you on the spot now. It's easy to watch... Australia and New Zealand netball. Are, are you following the Super League? Do you have a okay. favourite team? You don't have to say Love for Lightning. <laughs> no, I, 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 I actually, well, Tamsin, you know I'm a, I'm a massive fan of yours and it was actually when you were at Surrey Storm that I, yeah. that I, yeah, and I really first got into the Super League at that point. So, gosh, that must have been, what, six years ago now? When yeah, you won, God, yeah. When you won at Surrey Storm and, and you were player coach, I think, that year. But I don't know. I mean, this year I was I was sort of thinking, well, I've got to back back the pulse because obviously I back the pulse of Wellington. <laughs> I, I live in London here, and they were doing so damn well, and it was so exciting. So yeah, no, I watch every every Super League game, and I mean, at the very least, I think it was exciting the fact that Sky Sport were doing these big bumper days, you know, where you would get four or five four or five games in one day but obviously it's real devastation that it couldn't continue and there was no way for something to be held this year yeah of course I mean everybody was gutted and we've had lots of chats about whether it was pulled too soon or could carry on the good news is and we're going to chat about this a little bit later the Super League is coming back it'll be back in February and obviously we've got the transfer window and lots of other uh, stuff to talk about I mean you mentioned the pulse there they were doing quite well weren't they three from three yeah. sitting at the top of the table before it all finished is there any particular players that sort of stand out I know we've got the big international names that play, play overseas but is there anybody you got your eye on well I always I mean I think uh, Siggy Berger is a really really exciting young talent it's it's just interesting isn't it because obviously Pop Gita is still such a star in uh, Super Netball in Australia. And so you just wonder, is Berger actually going to get that exposure at an international level as goal shoot? But I mean, it was working, wasn't it? She was absolutely incredible. 
Yeah, indeed. And, and you're picking up there on the personalities as well. Siggy Berger is, in fact, a character. She's hilarious. And, and when you talk about that crossover into sort of mainstream, me, mainstream media and that profile, uh, a character like Berger is, is really key. Um, but sticking on current topics, Silver Ferns, did you see the announcement this morning? Are you happy with Nolene, the queen of netball's squad choice? I'm not even sure we're allowed to debate it, are we? If Nolene says it, it goes, it goes. Yeah, I think that is true. I think that is true because... <laughs> I mean, I have to admit there were times before the World Cup where with some of Noel's selections, I was like, oh, I'm not sure. But literally, as a New Zealand Silver Ferns fan, you were just like, in Nolene, we trust. And <laughs> actually, that worked. And that, that came true. And I, I have to tell you the story because it actually, Nolene and, and Debbie Fuller, who uh, is the assistant coach of the Silver Ferns, but was previously the coach of the Mystics, they are actually, and Debbie in particular, is, is actually responsible for getting me into netball in the first place because she taught at uh, my mum and dad's school. So my mum and dad are teachers in New Zealand. And Debbie, when she was Debbie Martoy and had just gone to the Silver Ferns, she was a teacher at my mum and dad's school. So I always used to go to watch her club team. And um, I'm sure you guys will agree as netball anoraks that this club team, they were called PIC, was literally the best ever club team in the history of netball, right? So I'm going to run you through the team. And this was my introduction to netball. So Bernice Mene was at goalkeep. Uh, Tanya Cox, who became Tanya Derns, was at, at goal. Sorry, goal, Tanya Cox was at goalkeep. Goal Bernice Mene was at goal defence. Uh, Debbie was at wing defence. Julie Seymour, who was then Julie D Dawson, was at centre. Gail Parata, who obviously went on to become the coach of Scotland, was at a uh, wing attack. Nolene Toto Abanis at the time was at goal <laughs> attack. And Lilani Reid, who was a brilliant Silver Ferns goal shoot, who uh, tragically passed away in um, about 20 years ago. Now, I think it was exactly 20 years ago, was the goal shoot. And so that was my introduction <laughs> to Club <laughs> Jeez. And it was literally the That's not like local team. league introduction, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. The national team right there. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it pretty much was, Mags. It pretty much was. Most of them were Silver Ferns uh, at one time or another. And so last year, when the Silver Ferns uh, came over before the World Cup, I was actually asked to host their welcome ceremony at New Zealand House, which is this incredible building uh, in Trafalgar Square in London. And obviously I hosted a QA and a and Debbie was on the panel and Nolene was there too. So we were able to talk about that great team. And so to be honest, I just think they are the queens, both of them, of, of netball in New Zealand. And I do trust their selections. But definitely today, there are a couple of surprises for me, more in terms of omissions. I mean, yeah. like Hotel wasn't in the main squad. I mean, I presume it's because, you know, they have these very, very high fitness standards now but I was quite surprised by that I mean her and Jane Watson are so formidable and they they made uh the final obviously and Phoenix Calica's out with in injury so I was surprised by that and uh, also you know Grace uh Nowicki not in the main side yet and again there's only three shooters who are not injured in the main Silver Ferns lineup and Ekinazio uh Maya Wilson and to Pia Selby Rickett. But again, I think Nolene is very much about experience and about not rushing people in too soon. But the real highlight, and I don't know, was she there when you were there, uh, Sarah? Uh, Maddie Gordon? Uh, was no, she wasn't. I think she, she, she came, she went as a training partner the year after I left, but she's been electric this season. And, and yeah. I think it's so exciting for the Silver Ferns to, to, to name her today. Yeah, so I think it's a great team. But obviously, I mean, this is rebuilding now because you've got no Langman, no Falau, no Kapoor, but again, I think we just trust in Nolene. She's incredible at developing talent and developing young players. Yeah, I was quite intrigued by the sort of partnership. So I know you mentioned uh, Parker Hockertow not being in the main squad. I think I definitely would have liked to have seen her bumped up, but it may be, as you say, the fitness element. But that partnership of Jewelry um, and Rore, that she's almost perhaps started to look at some of those combinations, very much like the Aussies do, that actually if you played well in your club team together, why not? give them sort of that, that help to go it's in there and then play it internationally. Um, it's interesting with Rore though, because I don't think Nolene views her as a goal defence mm -mm. at the international level. She views her as a wing defence. And I think for the Pulse this year, she literally only had about half a game at mm. wing defence. Yeah, Max, what about you? Oh, sorry, I was going to say, Max, your, your thoughts on omissions? Because I was very shocked that Toei Arva isn't in there. 
Now, I think personally, having looked around the board and played for a very long time, the skills that that girl has are, I, I don't think I've seen anything like it for a very, very long time. I mean, I've championed both um, um, Toeva and, and, and Gordon. I mean, Gordon for me was the, has been the, the best new player of the, uh, the whole season. Um, again, you know, you can only take so many. I like the fact that she's introduced Gordon because I think she's earned her place there. Um, but I, you can only take so many. Um, maybe, you know, I sh I've not seen the list. I'm going to be straight up and say I've not seen the list. But I mean, I don't know, does she have any sort of like training partners in there? Was there an opportunity for yeah, her to get so, in there? So there's a, so there's a 10 person development squad and she's been very clear that people from that squad can jump up. So for example, Sam Winders, I was quite surprised, isn't in the main squad, but she's still in the development squad. But yeah. there was, um, but I was quite surprised too that Edna uh, Mikhairi, uh is in the development squad, but Tiana Maturado, uh, you know, from the polls is not. And again, I think that that's probably protecting her because of her age, but I think she's absolutely brilliant. And it's just unfortunate that she's in a team where there are two such strong shooters and um, Aliyah Dunn and Ekinazio, so she hasn't had the court time. But I thought that was a pretty tough omission for her because it's pretty much saying well, you're going to have to leave the pulse and go to a team where you're going to get regular game time if you want to be a silver firm, which she obviously does want to be. I, I, I think the selection is, is pointing to a very specific type of play as well. Like you, in your wing attack, you've not taken Toei Arva, but you've taken Whitney Sooners, you've taken Gina Crampton, you've taken Maddie Gordon. You're obviously going for speed. And I guess something against Toei Arva is that New Zealand haven't got a massive shooter. You're not, you're not going to... Th like bash it in from the halfway line. Um, they've got Maya Wilson, who's good, on, who's a really had an exceptional season, great mover. Um, so I think that they're looking at that end, and it's just such a mobile attacking end that I think perhaps Nolene's going well. Who fits with this? Does Sam Winders fit? Not necessarily. Does Toei Arbor? It's not really Mystic's game, but it's tough for some of those players because some of them have had great seasons. Alia Dunn's another one. Um, mm. There was a lot said about her missing out on World Cup due to fitness, and and she's not in this squad again. And and <laughs> I mean, it, it's you see, for me, for me, Sarah, to get in that know, squad, let alone in your twelve. I know uh, to call the backup uh, a development squad, then it should have all those girls in it. You know, the the young stars who have stepped up this season and shown that they can bring their game. You know, against the toughest opposition. You know, so the fact that she hasn't taken Toei Eva. I am surprised because she mixes up the timing in that attack. You've got three speed freaks that are exceptional players. But, you know, sometimes you maybe need somebody in there that can mix that timing up. And I am convinced that Toe Eva could do a job, whether she's got, you know, Grace and Wecky to feed or she's got somebody else that's shorter. So I don't know. Is hers a fitness thing again? I don't know. I think but it must be the fitness because Taylor Earl uh, from the Mystics is in that development squad. So I can only assume it's down to go away, work yeah, on okay. fitness, meet the standards, and then we'll consider you again. Because Nolene did pick her in one of those, squ uh, those test squads before the World Cup and did give her her Silver Ferns debut. So I think she's clearly a fan yeah. of her style, but I think the fitness is everything for Nolene. Did Poi make the list, the development? Yeah, she, she's in, Poi's the, in the main, main squad. squad. Right. I think they're in such a um, such a fantastic position, though, where you can cut players like that based on you can take <laughs> such a hard line on that and go, you know, if you're not if you're like one level off this fitness, you're not in because we've got five more players one in your place, and I think that's a, a place that New Zealand hasn't been in. Well, most countries haven't been in for such a long time, and it's 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 really exciting to see that. I think that's really important, Sars, and and um, New Zealand getting back playing before everybody else and being able to. Uh, like bleeding these youngsters who have literally stood up to the challenge slotted in seamlessly to their sides I, I think it's shown the massive advantage they're going to have moving forward so um Dan parting question then for you uh with all these new youngsters and all these talents coming through in your eye and all the different leagues around the world can New Zealand do it again you know I'm guessing Nolene's taken on that role because she she knows she's got this great group of players do you think what is it 2023 
uh, South Africa. Yeah, yeah they're, they're going to lift that, that gold in South Africa. What do you reckon? Well, I guess the Commonwealth Games is going to be her real immediate goal because Australia are going to be so desperate for that gold. England will be absolutely desperate to repeat the success. And obviously, it's one that she doesn't have in, in her personal uh, trophy cabinet, either as a player or, or as a coach. And I think with Nolene, they could. But I don't know if you guys agree, but the, clearly the big test is going to be how the players come out of Suncor with the new super shot, all of those new rules, and whether it affects them going into the international arena. Because, of course, the difference with the New Zealand League, the ANZ, is that it's very traditional rules, international rules. There were lots of question marks in the early days about whether it was going to have a high enough standard as a domestic league for the Silver Ferns to stay strong. But I think it has allowed the Ferns to focus on their own style. Obviously, you've seen Nolene and Debbie on the benches this year. So I, I, I don't know. I feel they've got a good shot, put it that way. And I guess I feel like, and this is a terrible thing for me to say, but I'm just being honest, I feel like it's going to be much harder at the Com Games for England to push into that final with the strength of Australia and, and New Zealand again. But of course, England on a good day can do it. But I think the side under Jess, there'll be just remains really untested at the moment. And are they going to get that chance to, to have the tests? I mean, that's the devastating thing for all of us, isn't it? Yeah. Because they don't even know if there's going to be any trans-Tasman tests this year because the border restrictions are now so strong between even the Australian states, let alone Australia and New Zealand? And would those players really be prepared to quarantine for two weeks? And actually, will the government even allow it? So many questions and fighting talk there from Dan. You've heard it here first. He's not <laughs> sure England are going to lift the Commonwealth Games. I mean, Dan, you're, you're barred from this show now. Forever. My dream, my dream, Tams, and my dream is actually a New Zealand... England final oh. because then I can't lose you see then I lose. <laughs> and that's why the hardest game for me and I'm not gonna lie I mean this is so embarrassing but I was literally I was so emotional I was in so many tears was um the semi-final at the World Cup between England and New Zealand because honestly my emotions were so torn I was so happy for Nolene and the Silver Ferns but then Tracy you know to to go out that way when her entire goal had been to win and for those players to see the devastation on their faces so to be honest for me I just never want to be in that position again where it's England, uh, New Zealand in the <laughs> semi-finals because that is just too heartbreaking. Maybe. Okay, so New, Ze New Zealand take out Aussie in the semi-finals. Yeah. That'll do. We'll take England Jamaica. Take <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then whatever happens, everyone will be happy with that final, won't they? I mean, just the camera on the Aussie Diamonds having to sit and watch the, the final would be, would be good enough viewing, I reckon, for, for people. Oh, please, <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, well Dan look it's great to speak to you if you haven't had a DM from uh, London Pulse by the time that this show has gone out I will be very surprised you'll have VIP front row tickets that we stash sent to you all over the shop um, well it's great to have you on uh, and thank you again for all the work you do for netball because it's so important for, for everybody involved in the sport that, that mainstream media that you know it's recognised and it is being talked about so we do really appreciate that as well well, I feel the same about all of you guys. Keep up the good work. And, and when is the podcast back? Not till next year. Yeah, we'll have we're, wait, we're waiting to see. But, you know, we're having a little break now and then definitely back for next season, but maybe before. Dan, with all your contacts, come on now. <laughs> In that pocket of yours. You, 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 <laughs> Look, and... And by the way, we scrub up quite nicely. So next year's BAFTAs, we're, we're fine. You know, don't, don't take this into account. We, we've got dresses. <laughs> oh, I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> no, guys, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. For having Thanks, Dan. Me. Thanks, Dan. Thank pleasure you. to speak to you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Uh, also, though, if you didn't know this month, we've partnered up with sports team app Heya. Heya is an app for your phone that helps your team grow while bringing everyone together in a shared love for sports. You can use the app to easily organize and communicate with everyone on your team and it's completely free to use and trusted by coaches, parents and players all over the world. There's so much this app can do from keeping all your team contact details stored safely to scheduling games and training, getting player availability, messaging everyone and much more. Uh, you can even set your teammates' challenges. Oh, this sounds, this sounds good. Uh, if you want to check out the app, it's completely free. Uh, just download Heya from your app store. And then, of course, let us know what you think. So, ladies, 
Super League transfer window. It officially opened last week. Uh, now, I'm a little bit out of the loop, but I think there was a period of time where you got to re-sign your, cu- your current players, mm-hmm. uh, which is easier said than done. And then, of course, it opened last week to a free-for-all. Yeah, everybody going for it. Is, is that about right? Am I up to date? Yep. yep. Yeah, you got that <laughs> yeah, right. That, that, yeah. So I think last, yeah, last, last week when, when they said transfer window was open, it was basically the end of the exclusive period for teams okay. to sign their own players. Yep. So now everyone, everyone just jumps in. Okay, so Leeds Rhinos, we know, are entering the league in 2021. It's been a long time coming. I know everybody up north will be very happy that they've got back. Um, So Dan Ryan is obviously trying to recontract, well, not recontract, contract a whole team. Um, But before we get into that, Mags, how important is it, firstly, that we even know a Super League is going on in February? I think it's absolutely huge. It's huge just for netball in general. It's huge for the uh, Netball Super League, having had to miss out this season for obvious reasons. Um, And it's huge for us in the North because we have so missed netball. Yeah, we've got Manchester Thunder, you know, who are just an exceptional team. But then there's this massive void between Manchester and Scotland. Um, And the desire for netball in the North has always been amazing. And, you know, we like to think that we've done our bit in developing and bringing on young stars of the future who are now scattered across the Super League as we speak. So, yeah, Leeds Rhinos are delighted that the confirmation has come through that it's going to take place. Um, we did have the opportunity to jump in in 2020, but chose not to opt in for 2021. And we were delighted that we didn't jump in in 2020. Um, but now becomes the difficult task of uh, securing players. Yeah, and well, I, I've, I've been through that, having left Surrey Storm, starting mm. at Watts, and actually making a good decision not to do it straight away. Having a yeah. summer just to prepare a whole team is a bit of a nightmare. Um, yeah. So a good choice by Leeds Rhinos. But Sars, I'm going to come to you with a difficult question. Uh, Dan Ryan's had to recruit a completely new team. So, you know, starting from scratch. And I'm, I'm aware that he probably, he's only got the open transfer window to do that. So not that current contracting space that the, the established teams had. Mm. Um, how difficult is that for Dan, starting a complete team from scratch? And, and of course, um, looking at what the objectives are. Is it a winning team? Is it a building team? Mags has talked about loads of talent up in, in, up in the north. How many of those players are still around or has that been lost because they haven't had a team for such a long time? Um, I mean, if, if you do it solely from, from the, the open transfer window, it is difficult because a lot of teams will have, have tried to keep their, their players from, from last year. I think one of the ideas of Leeds coming in is that the talent that is in and around Yorkshire gets an opportunity to play at this level. So, yeah, you do need you do need big players from other teams to, to come in and provide experience and to provide leadership and things like that. But the, like I said, the, it would be great to see some Yorkshire players in there and some, some players from, from the North in there and, and, and kind of making the, the spine of that team because there's no point adding more and more teams to the league if we're just going to dilute the player pool. And if, if you've got like I, I, I do think that 15 is a bit many for, for, for people to have in squads. But if you've got 15 in 10 teams, you've got 150 players. If you, if, if you then just spread those players out amongst 11 teams, I don't think that's necessarily the idea of it. it, it you, you need to also grab those Yorkshire players that haven't had an opportunity to play at Super League level and give them an opportunity. And it takes time. So I, I, I think it's difficult to go in and, and, and win it or be super competitive in the first year if, if, if your aim is to, to give lo- local players a chance because they've not played at that level for, for a while. But there's definitely a building period um, if, if that's your philosophy um, that, you know, like I said, you, you've got your core players as Yorkshire players. And I don't know what Leeds' aims are, um, but it'll, it'll be interesting to see what they do in this transfer window. Max, can you do both? Max, sorry, can you do both? Can you bring in some young, young players, some young talent that have perhaps not been exposed yet and fill that in with a few experienced players. And if you can, what areas of the court are, are your biggest concerns? Like where do you focus? I was always like shooter, get a shooter. Defenders win your ball, people throw ball away, especially in the Super League. Get your shooter tied in, everything else follows. Thank yeah, you, I Rachel you make, Dunn. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and what a superstar Rachel is. I think you, you, you've hit the nail squarely on the head there Tamsin the the aim would always be to try and um, have a spine of Yorkshire players 
it's a case of getting, you know, ideally we'd love to get back what we developed, you know, three, four years ago, but they are embedded within other franchises at the moment. And yeah, we do have some fabulous youngsters coming through. And if, if, if spectators and fans and the media allowed you that be- bedding in period and didn't absolutely rip you to pieces if you were that team that, that lost every week, because they weren't aware of what your philosophy was to allow these girls the opportunity to get on court and to experience playing against the best of the best, then that would be great. But, you know, there's only so much um, beating with a stick you can take if you don't have a winning team. We would ideally want um, a cohort of players who uh, competed and were there or thereabouts. And to be able to do that, you need a scattering of experience across your, your, your squad. So, yeah, we do need a shooter and we would love to get an experienced shooter so that that job's done. Um, Ideally for me, I would like one in the middle, one at the end, (laughs) and one at both ends rather. But that's not my job. That's Dan's job to go out there and try and find these people. And then just you fill it in then with the youngsters who um, are showing the correct aptitude and attitude to step up to this massive, massive task. We have struggled because of the fact that with not having top flight netball in the uh, region, you know, we used to attract them to the universities and that's where you would sort of pull some of these players from, but we don't have that. Albeit, I think that there are now girls, younger athletes within the Super League setup who are looking at coming to Leeds and it's been a first choice opportunity for them. So I think we need to think about the attack being number one, firepower 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 that you know regardless they'll always score their set will score from a center pass um and keep the scoreboard ticking over and defense whatever they pick up would always be a bonus so yeah attacking end unstoppable is what we would like and then the defensive end maybe that's where our development is i'm guessing sorry you've got Cholock signed on a five-year deal right <laughs> <laughs> signed until she's 52 <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let, let's talk about um, the other teams. So we've seen recently uh, the retirement of Hannah Knight, uh, Katie Hughes at Surrey Storm, um, of course, Catherine Turner, congratulations on her pregnancy. Um, who, who do you think teams are going to be missing? Who do we want to see over here? Like, is there any exciting overseas players that we can think of that we'd love to see in the Super League? Like, what do you think the other teams are going to be looking like this season? I think it's an intriguing transfer window because... The three players you mentioned, all massive players for their teams. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not like, with no disrespect to any other players, it's not like you're losing, they're losing players who can sometimes play, sometimes not. It doesn't, they don't make a massive, huge difference to to the outcome. All of those three players are are, are sort of linchpins of the team. So I think that that's one thing. Thunder will go through a bit of change because Catherine Turner's not there um, and their attack end will look different. Um, but they've got strength in depth. I think what will be interesting is to see how many imports are in the are in the Super League this year because of COVID and because of the financial difficulties teams are having, mm. whether that dries up a little bit or whether teams kind of double down and go, you know, if we want to make money this year, we have to have big names. Um, and I think that's a, a balancing act for, you know, the coaches versus the boards and the people with the purse strings. Um, but, I mean, there's definitely... There's definitely people you'd like to see in our league. I'd, I'd like to see some, some of this New Zealand talent that we've been talking about. I think that what New Zealand have done really well is boxed off their league and said, if you don't play here, you don't play for the Ferns. Mm. And now you don't see them travelling. You don't see them moving. And I think I mean, we need to be careful that our players don't get drawn there. Well, I mean, Terry Arva coming to Sirens just for thought for a couple of years. I mean, we'll probably make her eligible for Scotland, won't she? I, I quite like, <laughs> quite like the tricks. Of my, I is that, are you giving us exclusive? Something you're giving, yeah, I was just about to say. <laughs> I'm just saying there are opportunities. Well, by, but you make a really good point, Sars, because I think the English young players over here have always seen the super netball as the way forward and the, and the league they want to go and play in. But actually with uh, the ANZ getting so much airtime and people talking about it as being the first league back. Do you think that's going to have an, uh, a sort of an effect on young players going, actually, I'll probably go and start my career out in New Zealand and I'm more likely then to get a shot in Super Netball? And if so, Mags, any, any key young English players that you think we might be exiting? We've seen the big names retiring or pregnancies, but what about the youngsters getting tempted? 
I think the temptation is always there. Um, it's more so for the ANZ League um, as a youngster coming through and showing some sort of attitude. I don't think that, it, like say, it's a, a sun court draw for them because I don't think a lot of our youngsters are ready. Um, I'm just wondering about the crossover of the leagues, how it would work and whether that would be a viable option for them um, and whether coaches here in England are prepared to sort of say what's being said in New Zealand, you stay here, otherwise it will affect, you know, how you move forward with your own netball career for, for the Roses. The yeah, it'd be interesting to be there, Tamsin. The temptation, yeah. because it's not just about the quality of netball, it's also about the, the lure of um, a, a decent payout for playing. Um, so it's, it's a, a win-win for any of our players that want to go out there. I, I think what's interesting now, though, with, with the England full-time contracts is if, if you go and play abroad, you lose that full-time salary. So if you're going to go, they're going to get, they're gonna have to pay you well to make up for the fact that you know, you're going to lose a full-time salary from England. So for those England girls, actually, they can't be offered minimum contracts in Australia and New Zealand because they'd be on less money than they, they, they are here for an England contract plus a club contract. So for them... But do you it, think, Sarah, just Sarah, but the draw of going and playing in those leagues, do you well, not think I, I, that it, would it, be a big I, enough draw? I don't know. It depends who you are and what situation you are. You know, like if, if you're a young player and you're on like a... A lower, a lower contract with England and you've got no ties here, then yeah, fantastic. If you're an older okay, player yeah. and, and you're on one of the top contracts for England, you've got a, a, a partner here and you've, you know, you've kind of set up roots here, then it's going to have to be a bigger offer mm. from, from Australia and New Zealand. And I think that's where England are starting to kind of redress the balance a little bit with these, with these full-time contracts. Um, but on the, other, on the other hand, Australia now, I think, are kind of dishing out contracts much more readily because they've, they've relaxed that import rule. Yeah. So I think some of our youngsters will get targeted, the youngsters who are in a position where they can take a lower offer from an Australian team and build the profile and, and kind of work up to a bigger contract rather than needing to go on big money. Well, it's going to be interesting. I think the New Zealand League is going to start to be a bit of a pull for players, regardless of the money, really, because I think they will see it as a stepping stone to get into Suncorp. And actually, if you've looked through past players, Sonia McClomer, Sarge, you had a stint out there, JD started there, Joey Hart and Serena, Serena all yeah. of those guys got into New Zealand before they made the jump to Australia. And, so. and people like Lenise Potgeeter, you know, people from other countries are seeing it that way as well. And I wouldn't be surprised if Khalifa McCollin ended up doing the yeah. same and going to, yeah. to Suncorp as well. So... For, especially for, for countries outside that top five, um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for them to, to, to make that step to, to Suncorp at a more gradual kind of rate. But, but, but it's, it's not, not all... Go on, sorry, Max. Sorry, Tamsin. I was just going to say, but do we not then come back to the Australian League for as much as it's the best league in the world because they attract the best players from across the world and they don't care about the import numbers and what have you. You know, it, it brings us back to... Are they doing enough to develop their own by allowing so many um, imports to, to, to flood their league? Yeah, it makes it exciting. You know, as a, as a spectator, you get to see all the best players in the world, just about, playing in the one league. But, you know, there's something to be said for what New Zealand have done and kept it really, really minimal with, with their imports and played their own because look at the quality of player and the quality of the games that we've seen played in the ANZ. Yeah, I, I agreed. And I, I think there's pros and cons for both. I think for world netball, I want to see the super netball keep doing it. For the Aussie Diamonds, if I was the coach, I'd be going, mm, I'm not too mm. happy about this. Mm. And I think it's lessons for us to learn. I think we've still got to find our own style over here from the Super League and also look at how the imports impact. And I, and I, I don't think it's all doom and gloom. Like We've seen so many players go on their journey from the English Super League. And I'm, I'm hoping COVID won't affect too much coming into this season and that you just have an odd few like what about Radaman you know she's on people's radars I'm yeah. guessing loads of teams have spoke to her that, that uh, you know I know rankings decide whether you can bring in certain players I know there were some uh, great players in the uh, Zimbabwe team at, at World Cup I mean you're starting to see little pockets and I, I really hope England don't lose that yeah and I think I think also you've got to you've also got to put the athletes at the center of this even even from a club perspective, you know, you want to win, but what's best for that athlete? You know, if, if we produce an athlete that is capable of going to Suncorp and delivering week in, week out in Suncorp, then to me, we've done our job. Like, yes, we lose that athlete, but that athlete's going on to the best league in the world to pursue a dream. And so 
we're not producing players for Suncorp, but if we do, it's still a good job for us. Because if, if you put the athlete at the centre of it, that, that's the kind of pinnacle for them. So it, it, should, be, um, it should be celebrated by clubs rather we're, than going, oh, we've lost a player. We're helping Jess Thelby. I remember patting Nat Hayes on the weight on the back and saying, you ever get that, you go, you jump on a plane the next day and go and take that opportunity. And I think that's so important. But I, I think what's even more important is, A, this Super League transfer window, we're talking about it. And mm-hmm. I'm really hoping the way it's released this year, we get more scope. And I love that the controversy of a new team coming in and who's made the move <laughs> and what that looks like. No, but it's thanks, I, <laughs> no, but it's well, I, it happened at Wasps, and I, and I get mm-hmm. it. And that, the sport needs that. The sport needs the debate and the chat about players and who's going where. Um, so I think that's going to be important. And just getting back playing in February is just it's so needed. So any conversation we can do up till that point um, is going to be key. But look, I, I need to move it on to um, ANZ and Super Netball. Uh, so the grand final, Pulse Tactics. I wanted Mystics. I wasn't afraid to say it, but we got Pulse, <laughs> we got pulse Tactics. Debbie Fuller reckoned Tactics were going to do it, and yet it was Pulse, their dominant display, um, that took the game comfortably in the end. Um, any thoughts on, on where they won it, why they won it so convincingly? Um, the, the previous week, a uh, podcast that we recorded, we talked about the the pluses and the minuses for both teams. And, you know, we talked about the fact that Tactics had beaten Pulse, but they'd beaten them without Echinacea and without Gordon. And I think both Sarah and I had agreed that for as much as Tactics were just getting it right, they were just rolling into the final beautifully. Um, With Gordon and Echinacea back, they're a completely different um, setup. And I think it showed. I think the pre-match discussion that they'd had with a couple of them, they'd said that they had wanted and had aimed for a good start because the good start is what sets most teams up and that's just exactly what Pulse did that first quarter they came out of the blocks and and just fired it in I think they were six goals up at the end of the first quarter uh, which is you know a horrendous deficit for most teams to sort of pick up and try and catch up especially when Pulse then they just step into the next gear for the second quarter and step into the next gear as they go through the game I think I it's think... key as well. Go on, sorry, sorry Sarah, what are you going to say? No, you go too. Well, I was just going to, I was going to post this to you. I, I think it's not always about names on a list in terms of, you know, how many silver ferns you've got, or what position they're in. It's almost about the experience they bring as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Maddie Gordon slotted in effortlessly, but she was with Econazio on the line with her. You know, she always had a shooter presenting herself. There was always options for her. That's not taken away with how incredible she was, but I think that kind of um, partnership matters. You agree? Yeah, definitely. And I think if you look at the experience Pulse have got, like how many, how many Silver Ferns caps have you got there? You've got Kelly Jury, Katrina Dore, um, Karen Berger, Claire Kirsten's played in the Ferns. You've got Econacio. Like, it's, it's a lot of experience. I think had, had Tactics gone six goals up in the first quarter, you'd have had a good game. I think because Pulse went six goals up, it killed it. Like, I, tactics didn't look like they ever believed they could win it from that point. They, they got closer. They got to within five, I think, in the third or fourth quarter. But they just, they just kind of suffocated them from, from the off. And I mean, it's great from a Pulse point of view. Like, <laughs> I was happy with it. I, I didn't want it to be like a one-goal thriller. Um, but I thought they controlled the game really mm. well, Pulse. I, I think for Tactics to have had a chance, they needed a much bigger game from Selby Rickett. She was very quiet. Um, in that final and I think she, she's played well for most of the season and made a huge difference to that tactics team but I thought she was really quiet in that final Yeah, I, I think that's always the key in finals and it's who steps up and Pulse as a team across the season have just been so dominant we, We've had a lot of chat about New Zealand netball obviously having Dan on the show um, and his knowledge, we were saying how, how he probably knows more than all of us, he's an absolute <laughs> netball guru um, So let's talk about Super Netball We're clearly ending this series of Netball Nation just as it's starting to get to the nitty gritty. Um, Thoughts so far, can anybody beat the Vixens? I'm I'm going for the Vixens at the moment. I think Lightning and Swiss have got a chance, but Vixens right now, when they play the right team, are they the team to beat? Vixens won't win it, I don't think, because Vixens... It's like Mystics, and and I'm not going to get burnt again because I got excited (laughs) all... And it's Mystics doing Mystics things. Like, they play great. And then when it matters, they just can't get it, get it over the line. Vixens are the same. Every year, mid-season, Vixens are favourites. Can anyone beat them? Oh, my God, they're incredible. They get to finals and it's like, pfft, like nothing. Like nothing do, you reckon, do you reckon it's going to be lightning then? The same final as last year then, Sarah. Lightning and Swifts? 
I'd, I don't know. I'd be surprised if Lightning don't make it because yeah, I, would, I think like Evan was telling us the other week, the fact that they go home every night is, is huge. They don't travel for games. They're, mm. they're not in a hub situation. They're living their normal life. They're training at their facility and playing at their facility. It's huge in a scenario like this. When you're talking about being away from home for 13 weeks, everyone else is just sitting there thinking yeah. about netball 24-7. Like you have a bad game, it is repeating on you until you play the next game. Whereas Lightning are like, you know, normal life for them. I think that's, <laughs> that's a massive advantage. Oh, absolutely. I, I've never been a huge fan of the Vixens, even, uh, you know, as a player. All I, I was actually surprised you said that because I was like, Vixens are not a Tamsin kind of team. No, they're, not my, they're not my team at all. I, you know uh, what I think it is when they play the right team across the board. I, I think there's teams with far more flair, far more ability to win and take out games. However, with the two point shot now, and I was, I didn't believe this. Nat Medhurst had said to me, Oh, Thwaites and Tegan Phillip, when they start stinking those long bombs, they'll be untouchable. And, and it's actually key. It will totally depend for me though, whether who they keep on the court. Every time they try and do Kumwenda with Thwaites or change it around, I, I think it doesn't work. Yeah. And I actually think lightning have been so successful with the fact that they're, Staying with their team, they're mm. playing it through, and then they're bringing on impact rather than Swifts are doing it at the minute, rolling, 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 rolling. I just think you're going to see a negative impact when the crunch comes on for Swifts. It, it'll be interesting, though, because I think, I think some of the teams are rolling it so much to try and get through the season unscathed and to try and get some freshness into people. So it'll be interesting to see the, the trade-off of that because I'm, I'm also very much a believer of, like, leave Mentally, someone out them a chance. Mentally, Mentally but, how would you have coped? Because I, I would have hated I would have, it. I, don't, I would have hated it, but Swifts did it before this rolling sub change, yeah. to be honest. They used to yeah. change the, the combination every quarter. So I don't know if they're a team that's kind of more used to it. And so come the end of the season, they might just get the benefits of having you know, fresher right. legs. Um, so we're all in agreement that those three are going to be in there. We're all in it's agreement. Yeah, yeah, in the mix. <laughs> in the mix. Okay, so uh, we have a question. We have a, a, a listener question. Uh, so... Uh, Firstly, <laughs> what did the panel make of the recent Manuwa sending off in the Giants game? <laughs> there was so much drama about this. I'm so, I was like this on Twitter. I just don't get it. It's, it's a rule. It's a rule. It's a rule. I think, that, I think the, the upset was about the fact that there'd be no caution, no warning. You know, the, the, but the hard. The, the hard. The, but that, that's what the point was, that they said they hadn't seen that, but it had happened. No, I don't agree with it. And, that, and it's not because of that. Like the, the protocol had been followed, like they would caution, warning. What frustrates me with it is it's a certain type of player that will get sent off for a certain type of challenge. Yeah. So Manoa got sent off with two, primarily because of two challenges for the ball where she had eyes on the ball and nothing else. Yeah. It was a Sarah Bayman special. (laughs) (laughs) Mate, I am properly on my soapbox about this because what I then see is people grabbing dresses, people hooking arms, People like easing pe- people um, into into people's landing space. Things that are a lot more um, meditated, a lot yeah. more dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. That go un like unsighted because it's not a big collision. Now, it was uh, it, the actual sending off. I thought was soft because of what had gone on before and the, the challenges that go in where people nearly lose their heads. It was a soft option. Well, I get all of that, but I guess my question is, what are we actually debating here? Are we, are we purely saying, because, because the warnings happened, the cautions happened, the rules were put in place, the player went off. That you can't debate. No. If we're debating now whether she, it was too soft, what are we saying? The umpire was completely wrong. And this is where I think it becomes dangerous territory because even over here in England, and Sarah will know that, well, you both know this, you look down the team list of, you, of your team and you look at the umpires you've got that weekend and you go... You already know mm-hmm. I'm going to have to adapt trouble. this. I'm going to have to change this. There's some that pull up attacking contacts. There's some yeah. that let things go. Yeah. You only have to look at last year's grand final to go the score or swings to show the difference in the style of umpiring. I just think it's a very risky path to go down to start debating whether an umpire deems something more aggressive or more contacty than another umpire. But that's, but that's exactly what's happening. Like they're going, I deem this to be dangerous. Well, no, it's not dangerous because Kara Conan saw... Manu- Manu were coming, coming. She turned it back. Yeah. Yes, it's a collision, but you know, whatever. I think the the difference in what people are getting cautions and warnings for is ridiculous. Joe Weston in the in the fever game had seventeen contacts and no caution. Oh yeah, no. So but how can is you, that? Can you stamp so it out? So it's the inconsistency, I suppose. Because it's, 
it's a yeah exactly but can you honestly in in the game of netball stamp out the inconsistency there's inconsistency on three seconds on obstruction no, there's, on. there's always going to be inconsistency i think what what frustrates me is like i said it, it's a certain type of player now umpires need to be aware of their unconscious bias because i don't think they are joe weston's a, a white blonde girl all australian looking and I, i'm i'm not even going to hold hold back on this Christiana Manoa is, is from an island background, is kind of noted for being more physical. And so I, I imagine in that game, and I don't know, but I imagine she had less total contacts than Joe Weston had in the mm. Vixens fever game. But because they look different and the contacts look a bit different and, you know, one of them is perceived as like butter wouldn't melt and one of them's an aggressive player, they get treated differently. And I think umpires need to be aware of what they're going into games perceiving already. See, Joe well, Weston, think, she's aggressive. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's I've, I've totally played on her. aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I mean, I personally, I, there's so many players I could list. And, but, and, and, list. and this is it. This isn't singling out Joe Weston, you know. Like, just an example, all of the defenders have have something right. going on. But I think it's an interesting point, though. Yeah. Netball Australia are going to have to, with the mix of cultures and different styles of play, and the way the teams are all playing now. I, I guess. Netball Australia and Suncorp Super Netball are going to have to address this kind of what, how do we get this consistency? You're never going to get it fully, but what does that look like? Well, but, those, I, but I mean, that's going to be through a support system, surely. And it, not it everyone has. Just and, going, and this is the other oh, side of it. Like, yeah. I feel sorry for the umpires because they're in a hub as well. They've given up their jobs and whatever for however long. Um, and they don't get the, the backing and the support that they need. And when you bring in, when these rules were brought in around you know escalating penalties and things like that I don't think umpires got the support that they needed around this and so that's why we see so much inconsistency because it'll be you know someone gets ca um, cautioned down one end they turn around the first contact in this in the next quarter the other that. umpire warns yeah. them and it's because yeah. they feel like they have to and I don't yeah. think I don't think it's properly understood and I think the umpires definitely need more support around it. Okay, well, look, I'm going to get to the second part of the question because, I mean, we could discuss that. I, I would go into the fact that Giants still should have won the game. They threw that game away. And how they oh, yeah. responded to the call was just, anyway, different Bizarre. point. Uh, right, so the rule states when a player is ordered off, that player's position remains vacant for the remainder of the game. What do we think of that? Obviously, a disadvantage already being down to six, surely that is punishment What enough. do you do if it's a centre? You can replace a centre, that's the only position. So then why can't you replace anywhere else? My argument would be that you are still disadvantaged. Just be allowed to switch your players around wherever they need to go. That gives you the best chance of staying in contact with that game. Personally, I think a sending off in netball just doesn't work for our sport. Maybe a two minutes or a two goals or whatever, but I don't think you can send someone off for the whole game. Even, even like basketball when you eject them and they can't come back into the game, but you can replace. But you can still. You can replace, yeah. Yeah, you can so, move them around. Yeah. I mean, Giants, as far as I could tell, Giants didn't put a different defender on because April Branley wasn't on the bench. So even if they'd ejected... Manoa and just not allowed her back on and they had to replace with a youngster I think that's still a decent enough decent. punishment yeah I, I agree I think um, it actually reminds me of a game a couple of seasons ago for Wasp we were playing a, a last game before semi-finals and the opposition had their goalkeeper sent off with, with still like 20 minutes to go of the game and I was asking the umpires as we were still playing to bring her back on I was like oh. I don't care Please, because this is no practice for us whatsoever. Yeah. And I'm going mad at Mel Mansfield on the bench going, get it sorted. You should have just sat, you should have just sat Rach down and you played with six. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could have been interesting. Anyway, um, I think we talked about the teams that we think are going to be in there to win. The, obviously, the controversy from last week. Uh, but let's go to more uh, Super Netball news. Laura Langman, she's retiring from international netball. Surprised? Legend. 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 I was literally legend. Uh, you called her the goat, Sarah. Are you surprised? <laughs> I mean, she is the goat, isn't she? She's um, best I, mid quarter ever. Best mid quarter ever. Or she's one off. up there. She's up there. Uh, she's she's definitely in the conversation, isn't she? I yeah. think best mid quarter of our generation for sure. Probably. Um, I think she's definitely in the conversation of best mid quarter ever, just because of the longevity as well. Am I surprised a little bit because no four what, years though. Most I was going to say, knowing, for four years. You want to knowing that, what she's like, she's an absolute machine, so she could probably still be playing like in 10 years' time. But She's your age, though, right? She's a year younger than me. So, so. What, what, how old is she? 34. Sorry, right. Sars, I've just outed you. Oh, cheers. Yeah. 
She's a very um, young looking 35. Yeah, I, I thought you talked about Laura. I was like, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, I think she could go on for a long time if she wanted to, because she's so incredibly fit and looks after herself mm. so well. But like, like, you know, Tamsin, when you come out of a, a world cup cycle, it seems like a long way to the next big competition. Yeah. And I I'll think, tell you what, it'd be easier to retire after a gold medal as well. wouldn't it? Like, I mean, yeah. well also like she's got everything she's completed, yeah. mate. she's completed netball. Like, She's got a World Cup. She's got multiple Commonwealth Games. She's got Fast Five. She's got the Sun Cup. She had the ANZ Championship before that. She's got national, New Zealand domestic titles. Like, if you create another competition, she'll probably have to stay because she'd have to win that. But <laughs> she's won everything. So what's the point? You know, you might as well just sit and, she and watch life, everyone try and be as good as she you. She wants a life. You know, her whole life has been netball and juggling everything else and we talked about this didn't we getting the balance between having a life and and your sport and she's decided now and i think rightly so at the right time go and enjoy life while she can still walk because we know what it's like with knees much and longer backs and stuff like that enjoy yeah your life. I, I i think it's true there's 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 life after netball and i think when yeah, you've done is. it all what do you keep playing for and i think she's got that joy at you know australia living i mean it's not not a bad place to live is it on the sunshine coast playing for lightning and in a style that she's clearly enjoying i mean it's sad for the international game but we've already seen so many stars start to emerge through that silver ferns group and i think um i think it's good when you can get out comfortably at the top when you can step away and oh, be content what yeah. what a situation to be in where you can be at the top of your game and, and choose yeah. to step away knowing what a job you've done for your for your team, for your country, but also the players that are now coming through, like she can step away and think this is, they've got this, like we're good. So she's been a standout in Super Netball. Anybody else, any other players before we get onto the net points, which is cracking me up reading through the next part of the show. <laughs> uh, we're nearly at the end guys, by the way, but anybody else that stood out, Laura Langman clearly well, always. For me, the best thing that's, that's happened to this Super Netball competition is Australia being forced to play young players. Mm -hmm. um so the young goal attacks have been a highlight for me mm -hmm. like you look at georgie horges at adelaide thunderbird oh, tipper dwan love her. at firebirds yeah um, gabby sinclair at magpies all and naya allen that comes naya on just allen, slightly like, she just well, shoots the balls. Balls. bash it in um they've they've been a highlight because i think mm -hmm. if you'd asked me six months ago i couldn't have told you the next Aussie goal attacks after no. the, the ones they've already had so I think they that, do this though don't they they do this it's that conveyor belt again like look they at the do young this, defender but, who's, who's the young defender at FIBA normally... um, oh Sunday Ariang. Ariang yeah oh my god amazing yeah. love her but this competition if it hadn't taken the format that it had would these girls have got the exposure no and I, and and I think that's... that's it like like we said about Suncorp I think for the last couple of years Suncorp's almost stopped Australian yeah. development because yeah. everyone's so intent on winning and winning every quarter because of that yeah. stupid rule Everyone yeah, it was stupid. Quarter, so they won't make changes. They won't risk anything on anyone. And now they don't. They're not worried about that. We're seeing the young talent mm. come through, and it's obviously there. And now they get an opportunity. Yeah, it's, it is great to see. Which leads us on to Super Netball net points. Now, you know what? This is really funny, right? Because I never get involved in Super Netball net points because I have no idea how they work. <laughs> so it's one thing being a netball geek that I totally avoid. Um, but uh, Sarah, you have written an explanation. No, it's not me. Don't be ridiculous. I'm going to say, it's bloody hell, Oh, really? That's what I've got. How so much I'm time do you think I have on my hands? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm not, I'm not even going to say. somebody else called Sarah? It, oh, is it? Okay. Uh, no one seems to have a clue. So uh, we've had an explanation. Or has this been sent in? I have no idea, but I'm going to read in. it anyway. Been sent in. Thank you. Um, so the... I'm not even going to go with statisticians, but the stats guys, <laughs> the, the geek guys, they record the whole game on champion data in real time. The team uh, uh, comprises of a caller and an inputter. The caller commentates on the game and the inputter inputs that commentary into the champion data system. Every single thing that happens on court is recorded. So the sense pass, the person who received that pass, the feed into the circle, the intercept deflection, pick up, blah, 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 shot in, shot out. Uh, where the shots were taken. I mean, this is good stats. Um, every out of court, throw in, bad pass, bad catch, footwork offside, et cetera, et cetera. So all that action is logged onto the champion data system uh, and then is associated to a player. And each, each action has been weighted with a number of points. So the program calculates the points per player in real time as the match goes on with a final total at the end. Mm. Obvious, right? 
Well, I think two points on that. One, what a boring job. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, there's stats and then there's too many stats. Yeah, right? I mean, you can have too many stats, apparently. True. Um, and then two, I, I kind of understood that that's what happened. What I don't understand is the huge discrepancies yeah. in the number the of points that's allocated. So a shooter's scoring like 100 Nissan net points and then a defender gets like, five clean interceptions is when it's like oh they've got 45 net points and you're like how is that it's the same is it like the international ranking system is yeah. this what we're going yeah. here we probably need to reweight this yeah so it, yeah i think i think the shooters have been coming out of this all right haven't they they've been coming out of it very well and then you end up with like mid quarters on minus points <laughs> the poor guys <laughs> they're not taking any center passes or they're being marked out of the game they are minus for that yeah you, you put one bad pass in you're on mm. yeah you're suddenly going downhill so, so do we want to stick with the netball net points? Or are we just happy? Well, I don't, to just... I don't, I don't use, I, I think they, the reason they've come up is because they talk about them so much in the commentary on the Suncorp. Yeah. That they've kind of made it a thing, whereas I'm not sure anyone else. What really purpose understands. does it serve other than a trophy at the end of the season for somebody? I just don't see what purpose it I, I think they're trying to kind of, you know, quantify how well someone's playing. But then but you can see that. But then you've got the issue with the, the weightings of, of points. Somebody somewhere, wish... some statistician has gone in and spoken to somebody, go. convinced them that it's a, a fabulous opportunity and, you know, it's more stats. Coaches love stats. Let's just do this. So they'll have created this program, charged them a fortune for this program, that they'll, you know, pay through the nose to get stats that they, they know anyway. They know if the shooter's shooting well or not. They know if the goalkeeper's... Well, I, think it, I think it's more for the fans, you know, so like, mm. you know, Joe the fancy netball the street. team. It's a fancy yeah. netball team. Pick, picking up fancy netball team and then working out. But I, I love the comments on social media. Like people were kicking off that Melissa Bragg wasn't in the um, net points team of the week last week because you know they'd calculated how many she should have had and she was hard done by and all of this. Stuff. Fans <laughs> like, are even doing it now. Yeah, well, well it's probably because their fancy team had been. You know, yeah. I must admit, I, fancy netball team aside, I, I would rather see those stats used as sort of like head to head. So you know wing attacks up there, how many centre pass receives, like, but also the impact on the game. I'm, mm. I'm not a huge fan of stats because they tell whatever story you want them to tell. You've got to try and actually find the truth in there somehow. So you know what? If, if a team has, has tactically planned to bring the centre pass through the back door all day, it doesn't matter how many times a wing attack has such the well, ball. Well, it's going to be on like minus 100 net points. <laughs> <or something. laughs> I mean, I'd be, I'd be terrible. No, I did nothing that a wing attack was supposed to do, but it, it worked all right out for me. So... I, I don't know. I think I'd rather see the statues in a different way. But I do love the idea of fantasy netball because I think, again, it gets another talking point and people interested in a different way. Mm, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, uh, I've chatted a lot today. Uh, have you enjoyed that, Tamsin? I, I have. I've loved it. We, come on now. Mags, it's me. It's netball. I've talked all day. <laughs> Is there anything else, guys, to get off your chest before I love you and leave you? What do you reckon? Mm. Sorry, are you going to give me any names? Any names for the scoop of, of Love for Lightning? Big and changes, small changes, for lightning medium this year. changes. Yeah, I think our aim is is consistency. I think if you look at um, the teams who've won Super League for the past five years, it's been teams who've been together for a good couple of years and and kind of had had some stability. So small changes, if possible. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's that's good enough. I I like that. I like that. Well, we will look. We, oh, I can't wait for it all to start happening. I love the drama around, around, as I said earlier, around Super League transfer windows. So let's hope England Net will start releasing those names soon and give us more talking points. Um, but that's about it for our last episode of uh, Series 2. Thank you for having me on, guys. I've thoroughly oh. enjoyed it. Oh, it's been, um, been great. Thank you. Uh, don't forget, we are giving you the chance to win a pair of ASICs, brand new netball trainers for you and a pair for a friend. We've eight pairs to give away of four shoes available now at Netball UK. So remember to go onto the website, click on the banner on the homepage um, and you'll be back to court ready. Now we can get back to court ready with Netball UK and ASICs. Um, and I think we'll be back well I say will you two will be back I might make another appearance at some point if I ever get asked back on again uh, but back in February for the Super League is that about yeah. right yeah good good so rest rest your voices enjoy pre-season it'll be a long pre-season um, and we will see you very soon see ya see ya bye this is Netball Nation